Keir Starmer has shown a ruthless streak in the three years since he's taken over the Labour Party. Mr Speaker, in case the Prime Minister hasn't noticed, the Labour Party is under new management. It's an approach that appears to have paid off with the public. Until now. Since leapfrogging the government in December 2021, Starmer has enjoyed a steady lead against the Conservatives in the polls, capitalising on the demise of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. But since Rishi Sunak took charge, the polls are narrowing, prompting some to question whether his pitch to voters is strong enough to get him into Downing Street. Welcome to the iPodcast, where this week we explore what's happening to Keir Starmer's lead in the polls and what it means for the future of British politics. We're joined by Paul Wall in Westminster to discuss what all of this means. Let's start from the beginning, Paul, with the story of polling. How did we start out? How did Keir Starmer begin? OK, when he took over in April 2020, things were looking really dire for Labour. They were on 31% in the polls. Boris Johnson was way ahead. Boris Johnson had just come off the back of, a obviously, a stonking general election victory in 2019, where Labour had its worst results since the 1930s. It was on 31%. Then what happened was that Keir Starmer took over and promised, essentially, a sort of big strategic change. And his team have always said they've stuck to their original promise, which was first, sort out the Labour Party, second, be more forensic in attacking the Tories, and third, present Keir Starmer to the public and also give the public some reason to vote for Labour, some policies. Now, the first year, let's be frank, yeah, changing the Labour Party, the first phase of that definitely happened, but it didn't register with the public. All right, there was an initial uplift in Labour's polling when Starmer came in, but then... Soon after, Boris Johnson was was in the full flight of the uh, vaccine bounce. And so a year later, I looked at the polls in May 2021, Labour were only on 32%. They'd increased 1% under a year of Keir Starmer. They had a disastrous set of local elections. They lost the Hartlepool by-election. And they seemed to be making no inroads, really, in key voters that they'd lost in 2019. So that's why people in the party started wobbling and wondering, well, is this really working? What's going to happen? Starmer's team stuck to the guns, to be fair to them. They said, look, things are going to be rocky, but we'll get it right. And phase two, attacking the Tories more effectively, did pay off. Although, let's be honest, there were some self-inflicted wounds as well. So when did we see that improvement for Keir Starmer? What was it that started to turn things around for him and for the party? The very first shift was, to be honest, straight after Boris Johnson had committed the parliamentary sin of trying to defend one of his mates, Owen Paterson, over this whole idea of whether or not he'd broken lobbying rules and whether or not he should be reprimanded for it. So that was a self-inflicted wound by Johnson. But Starmer was pretty good at highlighting the unease on Tory benches that, hold on, can you really trust a word this guy says? And then, of course, Partygate hit. You might say another classic example of Boris Johnson being his own worst enemy. People say Keir Starmer's a lucky general, but actually he makes his own luck. So his forensic approach to PMQs and Labour's parliamentary operation was pretty impressive in forcing Partygate onto the agenda repeatedly, hammering the Tory splits on it. Ultimately, last summer, actually having a motion, very cleverly drafted motion, to have an independent investigation, the one that's currently ongoing, into Boris Johnson, whether he lied to Parliament. Now, that didn't happen by accident at all. That was Labour doing some clever tactics in Parliament, forcing the Tories inadvertently to signing up to something very strong, this inquiry. The other bit of luck you might say they had was that this trust obviously imploded last year. So that was really, again, a bit of good luck for Labour. But again, you make your own luck. On the day of that budget, when all the Tories were waving their order papers in the Commons and everyone was saying, oh, this is great when Kwesi Kwarteng delivered this stupendously stupid budget where he gave a big bung to the richest in abolishing the 45p tax rate, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves just hammered it straight away and said, hold on a tick, this is a bung for the rich. This shows where your priorities lie. Overall, Labour people say the last three years show you have to be ready for when governments make mistakes. You need to be a pretty lean, agile machine in opposition. 
So that's Labour's pitch, and you can imagine Starmer's team's pitch of how well he's done. Of course, there are the downsides too. And it's not just attacking the Tories, is it, that they've been doing? They've also had to work to kind of have a pop at the previous Labour leadership. They've been really trying very hard to shed the skin of Corbynism. How's he gone about doing that? Quite ruthlessly in many ways. One thing that has irritated a lot of those Corbyn supporters who gave their votes to Keir Starmer in the leadership contest was he had these 10 pledges where he said basically lots of Corbyn style things. He would tax the top 5%, he would nationalise rail, mail and energy and a whole string of promises about party internal affairs, for example, objecting to the central party imposing candidates in selections and basically standing up for democracy of ordinary Labour members. Now, he hasn't done any of that in many ways. In fact, he's done the opposite. But what's happened is that the Labour Party itself has changed a lot, Molly, over the last three years. Keir Starmer inherited a Labour Party that really was Jeremy Corbyn's in many ways. Quite a lot of the members, new members, younger members, have been brought in by him. And since Starmer started wavering and reneging on the Corbyn agenda, you've seen a steady drift, if not a real exodus, of a lot of those Corbyn supporters. And they simply just let their membership cards lapse. And almost by default, the left has sort of given up. So the party has changed quite a lot. Now, Starmer's people say they've reclaimed the party from people who weren't really Labour people in the first place. Some of them were green. Some of them were very far left. They say that actually the Labour Party now is, is still got a much higher membership than it did under Ed Miliband, which they say says a lot. And it's always worth remembering in this equation that Starmer's lot, it's not just about dissociating themselves from the Corbyn era. What really gets them into government is dissociating themselves from the Miliband era. So it's not good enough to just be seen as some kind of soft left alternative to the government. What they want is for them to look like a government in waiting and a prime minister in waiting. And I think that's what they say they've got, even though Ed Miliband has been doing some great work on their environment and helping Labour. And you mentioned maybe the left wing of the membership having potentially died down a little bit. Has that translated to the more left wing MPs or is there still a vast amount of infighting in the parliamentary party? Well, there's not really much infighting because I think in a way the left wing MPs certainly still exist. And what's interesting is some right wingers tell me that they wish that they'd done more to deselect the current set of MPs that are on the left. However, the campaign group, as they're called, of, of left Labour MPs are still pretty strong. You know, people like John McDonnell, they're quite smart at keeping their profile alive and keeping their ideas alive and saying that actually there's no point junking everything that Labour achieved in the 2017 general election, for example, when it surprised everyone under Corbyn by having a radical agenda that seemed to strike a chord with the public. So they say, look, it's still worth fighting for. We haven't gone away. But they're the people who say, look, you know, Keir Starmer didn't really cut it in the first year. But, you know, what do we stand for? And is what we stand for really worth it? Are we any different from the Tories? Scarlett Maguire from JL Partners has been polling voters about what they think about Starmer's attempts to turn around the party and the holes in his approach that could come back to bite him. So I think one factor that you have is that there is still a huge amount of people that don't know how they're going to vote. So, you know, there's sort of 30% of the electorate there or thereabouts who don't know or say they would not vote in an election. They're sort of up for grabs. And even the people that have said how they're going to vote in all of these polls, none of them are completely locked in. I mean, mm. I was in a focus group earlier this week and one woman changed her mind three times in 60 minutes about wow. who she was going to vote for. So, you know, there's that normal sense of like, I think that's what 30 point need. It was, it was never, ever going to be locked in mm. for, for Starmer. And, you know, voters changed their mind, especially, you know, we've known how volatile the last few years are. That, that is reflected in how people feel about politics. Obviously, the biggest question is going to be, are these polls, are we going to see the gap narrow increasingly? And is the last two months of an upward trajectory for Sunak, where he seems to have got better control of his own party, where he's made some progress on some things? whether he can keep that momentum going, because actually, if we're looking at an election at the end of 2024, there's not a huge amount of time. Mm. And I think what, again, what you see, um, especially in focus groups, and you know, you'll see, you'll see this sort of written all everywhere, but I think it's fair to say that a lot of voters are still not sure about Keir Starmer. 
a lot of them completely fed up of the Conservatives and the last 13 years, but they're definitely not won over. You, you hear the same things. They don't know what he stands for. They're not sure what his vision is. They're not sure what they're going to do on the economy and the NHS. And, you, you know, you just feel like to make Labour feel happier, they're, they're going to need to convince people that he's not just the least bad option. Mm. Mm. Well, let's talk about the other line on this graph. As you mentioned, Sunak has seen an uptick recently. Things are looking much better than they were. What's driving that? How is this looking? If you were on the sort of Tory camp right now, what are you thinking about the state of Sunak's polling? The question is just whether this uptick can be sustained, how much of their voters they can win back. So if you think about their 2019 voter base, so everyone who voted Conservative in 2019, They've only at the moment retained about one in two of their voters. So if that was reflected in an election tomorrow, it'd be catastrophic for them. Mm. Lose hundreds of seats. You know, in the Red Wall, we did a tracker recently where that was a month old. So when the polls were a little bit worse for him, but not significantly, it would show that, you know, they'd lose all 45 seats they won in the North and Midlands. So that sort of picture you're looking at. Of that 50% of 2019 Conservative vote, that at the moment say they're not going to vote for Rishi Sunak, about 15% of those have switched to Labour. The rest still say they don't know enough for grabs. Mm. The problem for Rishi Sunak is he's not only going to have to win back the don't knows, who are by nature a bit warmer to him, still entertaining the idea of him, he's also going to have to claw back some of those Labour switches as well, which will be harder to do. So I think he's obviously set himself these five pledges. We've got Kiss Thomas Five Missions, for that matter. There's not much cut through on those. People don't really seem to be picking up very much. But I think what people obviously will feel is whether there's any meaningful progress on the sort of cost of living crisis. And I think NHS and waiting lists in particular. So my suspicion is his performance in the polls will be tied pretty directly to how much progress we start to see from that. So we've talked about the kind of main threats to Rishi Sunak, which is probably going to be around what's in people's wallets, essentially. What's your read on the main risks to Labour's positive polling? Are there any particular danger areas for them leading up to the next election? Yeah, I think that's a good question. So, you know, as I said, I think a lot of the problem potentially is still around Keir Starmer's brand. And I think not knowing what he stands for will become more of an issue. So people always a bit nervous, even though actually at the moment, obviously, you know, polls are showing that public potentially trust blame more on the economy. Some people still have nerves about what Labour would do mm. in terms of the economy and government. So we'll have to neutralise that. And at the moment, Rachel Reeves doing a sort of good job of controlling absolutely any announcements on spendings as to not scare the horses. But at some point, they are going to have to say what they would do mm. and why. And I think that's obviously dangerous ground for them. I think he is vulnerable to this idea that he changes his mind a lot yeah. and he changes his opinions and that that is something that could be exploited or, you know, there could be more issues that come up that he might go back and forth on. So I think he's probably vulnerable on that. It seems like at the moment the it, this is probably a bit too simplistic, but uh, Sunak is far outperforming the Conservative brand and their best hope, whereas Starmer seems to be the biggest drag on Labour's. So I think anything around the Labour lead will probably be focusing on those perceived weaknesses or rather lack of strength from Starmer. And you see this actually in the best PM numbers, which are often a better indicator of general election results anyway. Yeah. They're actually sort of neck and neck there. So, and again, the same, we see the same trajectories, Starm slightly down, Sunak slightly up. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see whether that changes because, you know, Best PM got it right in 2015 when voting intentions got it completely wrong. So it seems that basically Keir Starmer is less popular than his party and Rishi Sunak is more popular than his. I think very broadly speaking, yes. From the corridors of power to the country at large, our political reporters and commentators work around the clock to bring clarity for our readers. To keep up to date with news and features, consider a subscription. Go to inews.co.uk forward slash podcast and get more than 30% off a digital subscription to I. I for Open Minds. Subscribe today. So we've established that they're in a much better position, at least with the public, than they were right when Keir Starmer took over. They had a significant lead in the polls, but recently those have been dipping and the Tories have started to do much better. What's going on? Well, I think some of it is just inevitable. The newness is quite valuable in politics. The shock of the new always helps. So Rishi Sunak's steadied the ship. The ratings are not as dire as they were under Liz Truss. However, they're still pretty bad. You know, as one Tory MP said to me, we've gone from dire to just ordinarily disastrous. <laughs> 
So there's still quite a big gap in the polls and the Tories on the current polls would be heading for a pretty serious defeat. However, they think that Rishi Sunak getting a few things right, trying to be a bit of a Mr. Fixer of the country's problems. They think that, that the public are beginning to recognise that. And at the same time, do we know the real third phase of Labour's under Keir Starmer, which is what does he stand for? What are the policies? Now, they've made some headway on things like childcare, their five so-called missions, economic growth, boosting the NHS, safer streets, green energy. Some of it is motherhood and apple pie, but they think they've now got the rough framework to go to then flesh out the detail in a general election. There's some nervousness amongst Labour MPs, definitely, about that lead shrinking a bit. But most of them actually quite welcome it because it keeps them on their toes. It means that they, they have to graph for things. I'm keen to ask you more about your read on the five missions, as they're called. Are they good enough, Paul? Are they going to answer the questions that people at the polling stations are asking? Well, there is some nervousness that although there are, there are five missions are, are a good way of focusing Labour's big priorities, I think there's a couple of big missing priorities there. One is social care. They don't have any real plan, it seems, so far for sorting out social care and the fact we've got an ageing population. The other big issue is housing. You know, where's Labour's policy offer on housing? Could you tell me what it is? Will they have a big council house building programme? If they do, how do they fund that? Do they want to change council tax radically, which some people suggest they should, to turn it into some sort of land tax, which gets more from the richest? So social care, housing, I think there are big gaps. If Labour really wants to be seen as a government in waiting, I think it's got to say something coherent on those and not just tread water. In your recent piece, you spoke to many, shall we say, slightly grumpy sounding Labour staffers, Labour shadow ministers, perhaps even, I'm not going to guess, Paul, at who your many sources are, but some of them didn't sound that happy. What's the mood in camp at the moment towards Starmer and his leadership? Well, I think on the whole, the shadow cabinet are very much on board with Starmer's project. They like the fact that he's learned on the job. He's got a lot better at PMQs, for example. He's a lot more punchy at PMQs. And you can credit him with landing a lot of blows on Boris Johnson and on Liz Truss and now on Rishi Sunak. And they like that. A lot of the shadow front bench for too long think they've just been taking it, taking the punches from the Tories for too long. However, there are others who just worry still that ultimately Keir Starmer is a lawyer rather than a politician and that he doesn't really grasp what Parliament's all about and make quite clear he has a disdain of Parliament which a lot of MPs actually think is a daft move because that's their only chance of having a go at the government and they think they've done a good job. Ultimately, it's very hard to read Keir Starmer. He's quite a private person. He admitted himself recently in a quite revealing podcast where he talked not about politics but about his personality. He said that he finds it hard to trust people and one of his biggest weaknesses is that when he's hired someone, he doesn't fully trust them. And I think that's one of the negatives, which is that the people he's taken on or has become his allies early on, a lot of them have been junked from the shadow cabinet in a reshuffle quite ruthlessly or demoted. And there's a feeling that if you can't stand by your friends, then who will you stand by? And if you're not loyal to us, should we be loyal to you? That together with this idea that they're not sure what he really believes, whether he is the Corbyn soft left person in his leadership contest or whether he is some sort of Blairite, but he's got quite a streak of ruthlessness in him, which means that He'll do almost anything to make sure there is a Labour government and he's a Labour Prime Minister. Someone who knows him quite well said it, he tries to hide it sometimes because he, he tries desperately to be Mr. Nice, not Mr. Nice Guy. But there's a there's a tough Keir, there's an angry Keir within him. And you see that sometimes apparently when he's playing five-a-side football. You know, he'll take someone out and tackle them really hard. <laughs> and some of his party really like the hard man Starmer. Some of them don't like it. Well, let's talk more about that ruthlessness. There was some controversy recently around these attack ads. For listeners who might not have caught them, Labour put out an ad suggesting that Rishi Sunak didn't support the jailing of paedophiles, essentially. It's got quite a mixed response. Paul, what's your reading on why these came out? Is he grasping at straws? And what the repercussions of those might be? Well, I can see their logic. I can see why they did it. They feel that there's this polling evidence which suggests that actually Rishi Sunak is more popular than the Tory party. Labour think it is a problem, and so they think they've got to erode that personal lead that Sunak's got. They feel that by chipping away at Sunak's record, and more importantly, tying Sunak as a man, 
to the consequences of Tory rule for the last 13 years, that that's the way they get what they want. I feel that it was actually a really, really bad move. It betrays Labour's so-called values about fairness and about truth, because it's simply untrue that Rishi Sunak doesn't want to lock up paedophiles. Keir Starmer's whole unique selling point was that he's a man of integrity. And he might be repeating the same mistake that Sunak made by saying he's a man of integrity and then rolling around in the gutter. So personally, I think it's a bad idea. And more importantly, in policy terms, this specific idea about why paedophiles are not locked up, some of them, in some cases, that's nothing to do with the government. It's entirely to do with the judges in individual cases and the extent of the offences, extenuating circumstances, all that stuff that comes out in a court case. And also there's the sentencing guidelines and the sheer fact that we frankly lock up far too many people in the first place. So prisons are overcrowded. There isn't enough space for these people to be sent to prison, even if judges wanted to send them there. Now, when you look at all that, that's more like a Labour argument, which is we should really be sending paedophiles to prison. But if the prisons are overcrowded, shouldn't we reduce the overcrowding by sending fewer people for less serious offences there? Shouldn't we look at the criminal justice system? I just think that that's the kind of territory where Labour would be stronger rather than personalised attacks, because maybe it is the Keir Starmer kicking his opponent in the shins on the five-a-side pitch, but I don't know, I think the public don't necessarily like it. Pollster Jack Peacock from Servation says the attack ads are failing to cut through, but the situation in Scotland might be far more significant for Labour's chances of winning the keys to number 10. So if you ask people, have you seen this advert? Not that many people have actually seen it. It definitely was a significant story amongst the sort of what we'll call Westminster group and journalists. And that is important because they are dictating national conversation and it is getting discussed on television consistently. It's remained top of the news agenda. I think that Labour was well aware the cut through it would get. It's a very, very emotive, evocative piece. But I think there's a couple of dangers there. One is that it diverts attention away from the cost of living and issues related to the economy. Now, those are voters' number one priority. Labour do well on those issues. The cons- confidence in the Conservative government is through the floor on those issues. You turn attention away from that. Now, Labour might be hoping that because this ad was so emotive, the initial one, people listen to their other messaging more, and they have now tried to tie cost of living issues to Rishi Sunak. And I think that what the ads are really trying to do is to say, Rishi is not independent of the previous 13 years of Conservative government. He's part of the Conservative Party. He's responsible to an extent for the problems we face now. With Labour, one of the benefits is that they are just an alternative and Mm. that we are in a very, very sticky situation at the moment economically. But if you've replaced a leader and you've got a new prime minister, it also feels like something fresh in that sense as well. So if you're in Labour HQ right now, you're looking at the polling figures that Servation and others are generating. Who are you trying to win over? I think there's a number of places to look. I think the one that's been very prominent in the news recently is Scotland. So at the moment, our polling in Scotland has got an SNP with an eight-point lead over Labour. The Labour recovery in Scotland is definitely real. It's going to be a huge battleground in the next election. Keir Starmer, prior to Nicola Sturgeon's resignation, visited Scotland only a handful of times. Since that point, he's been up in Scotland a number of times. Mm. And Scottish Labour is attractive to SNP voters who view independence as a longer-term deal because it gets the Conservatives out of Westminster. But they're also attractive to unionist voters who want to reduce the SNP's majority in Holyrood and in Westminster. Interesting. So they might actually pick up from both camps. So you can pick up from both camps, yeah. I mean, increasingly, the 2014 independence referendum is becoming further and further away. Now, a lot of people vote for the SNP not just because of their all-in on independence, but also because they offer a sort of social democratic form of public services, that sort of governance. That's something that Labour's also going to offer. One interesting thing that we're seeing at the moment, actually, is that 2019 Liberal Democrat voters, Keir Starmer is very palatable with them. So you're thinking sort of higher level of education, higher income voters in some of what we might have called like the blue wall contest before, middle class commuter belt. Keir Starmer is very popular there. In our most recent poll, he wins about 44% of the 2019 Liberal Democrat vote. In terms of characteristic, his numbers are very similar to Ed Davey with uh, Liberal Democrat voters. Mm. That's going to be an audience which Keir Starmer is going to play very, very well with. I'm interested in picking your brains a bit more about Scotland. I mean, the SNP are, by any measure, in free fall. There's Mm -hmm. some sort of enormous meltdown north of the border at the moment. 
they're still polling ahead of Labour, according to your polls at the minute. Why is that? The SNB has very robust support. You've got to think the extent to which they represent the independence movement. They have a very high floor, but quite a low ceiling, which is that they're going to continue to sweep up most of the yes voters, but they're not quite as palatable with people who voted no in 2014. So as I say, it's a very high floor, low ceiling. OK, so Labour are likely to pick up from the SNP, but it's not a total wipeout situation. I don't think we're looking at a total wipeout situation. SNP support is still quite robust. Well, so, I mean, as I say, the standard disclaimer with poll win rise to look at the aggregate and look over a longer time scale. We've had one poll since Humza was elected first minister. It's going to be interesting now in the context of the arrest of Peter Moore on the party treasurer as well to see how that plays out. I think that one thing we do see in Scotland is a really, really strong anti-conservative sentiment. So if voters in Scotland believe Labour can form a majority government in Westminster and it's a real alternative to the Conservatives, it's a real opportunity to get the Conservatives out of power, I think you can see increasing support and Labour will pick up an increasing number of former SNP voters who view independence as a longer term project. Because you, one, you've got the Supreme Court ruling, which means that the, the strategy for independence, it can't be we're going to hold an independence referendum as soon as possible. It's, it's not going to work. But your calculation as a voter might be, it's more likely that's going to be the case with a Labour government. And it'd be better to be governed by a Labour government in Westminster than it would a Conservative government in Westminster. So I think that tactical voting in that sense in Scotland is going to be a big part of the next general election. Paul, does this change in fortune mean Starmer is doing a good job? Or is it just luck? Well, again, this is the point, Molly, about Keir Starmer being a lucky general, but also making his own luck. Because, yeah, he's very lucky that no one would have predicted so quickly the, the demise of the SNP's profile. The key thing about Scotland is the polling there is different from the national pollings. There's a big tipping point between Labour getting a small number of seats and getting a really decent number of seats. And that tipping point is roughly when Labour gets into the early 30% in, in Scotland and when SNP comes down in the 30% in Scotland. And as soon as that happens, instead of just hoping for and guessing they'll get maybe six, seven, nine seats, now we're getting in territory where Labour could be looking at 19 seats, 20 seats. That matters massively because the more it does better in Scotland, the less pressure for turning over seats south of the border in England and in Wales. So just finally, Paul, with your vast amounts of Westminster experience, where would you see the polls go next? If I were to force you to put a bet on it, which direction are they heading in? I would personally say I can see a bit further narrowing. If Rishi Sunak manages to pull off a few more coups, such as, for example, sorting out the strikes, if, if he settles those down, if, for example, in the autumn statement, a lot will ride on the autumn statement, Molly, this year. That's when the Tories really want to roll out their big guns on the economy. They want to announce income tax cut for everyone that will kick in next May. That would give them in the run up to the general election a decent chance. A lot of these voters are undecided and Labour knows that and the Tories certainly know it. A lot of the people who used to be in the Tory camp have simply gone to the don't know camp. Now, a lot of people don't realise that in 97, that enormous Tony Blair landslide was in large part not due to Labour switches from the Tories. It was due to Tories staying at home. So that sense of disillusionment amongst the voters is what Starmer has got to capitalise on. I think Sunak's, you know, the odds are against him because I personally think that it's very difficult to see how you can tell people that their wages are not being squeezed, even if inflation is coming down. And when our economic growth is so anemic, it's very difficult to turn that into an optimistic message after so long in power. It's going to be tough for this, for Sunak, but Starmer may well be his biggest weakness is on flip flops. I referred to it in my piece and shadow ministers have noticed this extraordinary video, which shows Keir Starmer saying one thing and then saying the exact opposite a few years later. It's that idea that you can't trust what he says that is quite damaging. And you're going to see the Tories hammering that message again and again. The Tories are going to come hard at Labour. And that's why I suspect, in a strange way, Keir Starmer's quite pleased that the polls are narrowing, keep him on his toes. Well, watch this space. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. It's always fabulous to get your insight from, as you famously described it, the bowels of Westminster. No problem. That's all for this week. 
You can follow Paul's commentary and reporting, as well as breaking news, in-depth features and insightful political analysis at inews.co.uk. As ever, we would love to hear your feedback. So drop us a line at podcasts at inews.co.uk. I'm Molly Blackall. You can find me on Twitter at Molly Blackall and on Instagram at molly.blackall. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.